Are you married or in a committed relationship looking for real advice on having love and enriching your relationship? You are in the right place. Welcome to The Couples Expert with Stuart Fensterheim. Hi, thank you for joining me again. This is Stuart Fensterheim, The Couples Expert, and welcome to The Couples Expert Podcast. This episode of The Couples Expert Podcast is designed specifically for those of you who have recently married and is, we would call, newlyweds. This is my advice for those couples. That doesn't mean the couples that have been married for years shouldn't pay attention, because the tips I'm going to give you, you can really do right now, starting today, to really make your relationship meaningful, significant, and have you feeling much more secure that you're in a marriage that feel so wonderful that you know that you will be together for the rest of your lives. And this is why we get married anyway. None of us get married to be finding ourselves in a empty, lonely relationship where we don't know how we even got here. So what my podcast today is going to be about, it's going to be giving you the tools and tips and my pearls of wisdoms, both personally and professionally of making your marriage last your lifetime and have you be one of the happiest people in the world. Because it's never really, it's never too late to feel secure in your marriage. But here's the confusing part. We don't really understand what marriage is all about. And that has a lot to do with the experiences you have had with your own family, with your parents, and what their marriage was like. The exciting news though is as experts in the field of couples counseling and relationships, we now know with all the research that we've done exactly how to create a relationship that goes from a feeling of disconnection to a feeling of connection. So my hope is most of you have done your research ahead of time, before you got married, But what I have found is that so many couples get married without the foggiest idea of what it's going to take to really have a relationship that's going to have you feel really important and connected to your partner in a deep emotional way. Two words I want you to be thinking about starting today. And those two words are authenticity and vulnerability. If you have a marriage, a relationship that is going to be described by both of you as the most authentic relationship you've ever had and the most vulnerable relationship you ever had because what you have in your partner is a relationship with a person that you trust, that you feel secure about how they feel about you, you will be able to go deep into a vulnerable place and share your most deeper innermost feelings. And that's going to be what you're looking for in a marriage. Now, if you come from a background in which your parents did not have that kind of marriage, then that's going to be an additional struggle for you. But if you've been fortunate enough to grow up in a two-parent home where your parents were deeply, happily married and passionately in love with each other, and demonstrated that almost every day of their lives together, that you now have a role model that's going to be able to be taken with you that should be one that's going to make your relationship just wonderful. Now, the question to ask yourself is, were they affectionate? Was touch an essential part of their relationship that they shared? Did they create wonderful experiences of each other so that when they went out together, they described the relationship as the two of us having the most fun when we're together? But if it didn't go so well, how did they address that? Were they willing to seek out help when they needed it? Were they able to get in touch with their loving feelings in spite of some of the difficulties that they had? And did they focus on repairing any damage that may have happened in their relationship? 
Did they have a relationship in which verbally and physically and in all ways they demonstrated to their partner that they were the most important person in the world and that they had a partner that they know had their back? If the two of you can emulate some of those kinds of things, you're off to a great start. But so many people's backgrounds aren't that fortunate. None of us have all those components all the time. But if we had enough of those and that you really feel that passion for creating a love story that the two of you can be incredibly proud of, this podcast is going to help you really stick to your guns. And if you haven't really had the conversation, and what I hope for is that most of you listening to this podcast have had some premarital work, that you've either sat down with a clergyman or a counselor, and you've talked about your marriage, your upcoming marriage at the time, and you're able to look back and say, we have the tools and the skills to make this marriage work. So this episode is for those of you that did have that and those of you that, that overlooked that essential place. Because whether this is your first marriage or your fifth marriage, the two of you need to be thinking about how are we going to keep our marriage alive, passionate, and close. And these tips that I'm about to share are going to be specific tips that will help the two of you start that today. So the podcast is going to be a different kind of podcast than I've done over the last few months. This one is going to be very specific and give you some specific tools that you're going to walk away with knowing that you're working on those elements that this couple expert, at least, feels is the most relevant to having that happy marriage. The first tip that I'm going to share is that you need to have a plan. This doesn't just happen on its own. And unless the two of you have a plan on how you're going to develop a strong foundation for your marriage, it doesn't work. I hope that most of you have done some reading on marriage and creating a positive, healthy relationship, and that the reading that you've done and the classes that you may have taken and the discussions that you had haven't been one that talks specifically about how to deal with this task or that task in a marriage, that it's been about developing an attachment to your partner that has the two of you having a close emotional bond. And that one book I want to mention, and I've mentioned it before, and as those of you who have been listening for a while know that I'm an emotionally focused therapist, I hope you've read the book by Dr. Susan Johnson called Hold Me Tight. You can get that on Amazon. There are workshops. There are programs all over the Phoenix metropolitan area and all over the world because this is a model that is an international model that has multiple and hundreds and thousands of couples counselors that will allow you to really find a pathway because we now have this map, this map that's going to help you understand what do you need to do to create an emotionally close bonded relationship. So emotionally focused therapy is one model. The other model is John Gottman, who has a lot of literature out there. And if you go online and you Google the Gottman method, you'll be able to find some of their resources. Both of those are an attachment-based model. That model is an essential. Now, why do you need a model? You need a model because just like building a house, unless the foundation is in place, the house is going to fall apart. Unless your marriage has the foundation of safety and emotional closeness and connection, your marriage won't last the test of time. And so many of you who are newly married, right now, things are going fairly well. But what we want is this first year of marriage 
to really be a year of learning and transition and setting up those models that the two of you can use, those structures that are going to keep your relationship strong. So, so have a strong foundation that comes from friendship, safety, security, and emotional closeness. It is absolutely critical for your marriage because that foundation is going to help you through any of the trials and tribulations that may happen. In order to have that, one of the first tips has to be learning how to communicate with your spouse. Not just learning how to communicate, but each person and each couple is going to have their own challenges with this because communication is really about setting up your relationship to really have the elements of kindness, friendship, and taking time to truly understand each other's perspective. When we get into a little tiff with our partners, that can feel very threatening, particularly if the two of you, for the most part, has not had a lot of conflict. Now that you're married, things are going to be much more important to both of you. And what can happen is you can develop a pattern of relating to each other that has moments of disconnection that feel very threatening. In order for that to happen, you have to have enough tokens in the bank that are going to allow you to see your relationship, not just at those moments of disconnection, but significant experiences that say, I remember recently when we were so very close. That is such an essential piece. So in order to do that, in order to have those moments, what you're going to have to do is set up rituals that the two of you will follow on a very regular basis. These rituals have to be times that the two of you have set aside to connect with each other on an emotional way. So that doesn't mean just a date night. That means you two are creating experiences, new experiences, fun experiences, experiences that have the two of you recognizing that we make fun because of our connection. The two of us create these fun experiences together. Not just sitting there and watching a movie together, although that's fine, it's fun. But going and having lectures that you see, going on adventures, doing spontaneous things that are going to create a lot of fun, like going for a hike. So around here, we have a lot of places that people hike, there's a, a preserve right around the corner from here that my wife and I quite often go to, that preserve is a fun and there's a four mile hike. So once what I did as a surprise for her, without her knowing, what I did is I, I threw a bottle of wine and some cheese and crackers. And when we got to the top of the peak, which is a really gorgeous peak, I pulled out a blanket, set up the wine and cheese, and the two of us had wine and cheese looking over at this wonderful spot. That experience in and itself created for the two of us something so much fun that any time that we get into an argument, I remember that. And it's so meaningful. And it means so much to me. And it means so much to her. And it's defined our relationship because what the two of us have done is intentionally, with positive intention, we have created a mechanism in which both of us, on our own, now wants to outdo each other when it comes to things like this. So there are other things that my wife has done that is a similar thing. So I see the energy that she gives to me what that does is allows our communication to be easier. And you would say, that's not really a communication skill, but I would tell you that it is. 
It's the way we communicate in loving, caring ways. The look she gives me, the touch when she were talking. If we're having a tender moment, there usually is some touch there. All of those things go into the communication. So how we define each other is as a kind, loving, giving partner that truly has my back. Those things will take you very far. If you don't have those things, it creates small little moments of disconnection to look like it defines the entire relationship, and that's not someone that you see as a friend, as an ally, as someone that's watching out for you. So having communication for the two of you that sends the right message, that's so critical. Now, what also goes into the communication, just to spend another moment with it, is the love language that we have. And so many of you out there, I'm sure, have read, and if you haven't, I do highly recommend reading it. It's called The Five Languages of Love. You want to understand what are the ways that your partner feels loved. Are they someone that needs affection? Are they someone that it's about words of affirmation? Are they someone that if you do something, quality time with them, those things really make the difference? Why you want to know that is because if you're communicating with them, that's what you want to do. We also have to understand in our communication that our partners have triggers. And if you haven't had the dialogue of understanding where their raw spots are, and that's not just raw spots within relationships, at least not intimate relationships, raw spots also sometimes could be about something that's happened in their past. And having vulnerable dialogues means hopefully the two of you have talked at great length about your past, about past relationships, about what your childhood was like. And if you haven't done that yet, do that today. Do that right now. Not right now. Finish listening to the episode. But make sure that you and your partner have that conversation because what triggers them will help you understand that if something happens and all of a sudden you see that they're upset with you and you're not sure why, you may have touched a raw spot. So having that dialogue and talking about any past unresolved issues that may have been present in your relationship. This is an important piece. So often I see couples in my office and part of the challenge for the couple is that there have been things that have happened between the two of you that hasn't yet been talked about. It's still left over. And one of the rules of communication has to be there is no issue that is not open for dialogue. In the old days, we would hear things like, you know, you can agree to disagree, and sometimes what you have to do is just take an issue, put it on a shelf, and say, we're just going to have it there, and we're not going to talk about it, that does not work any longer. We know that from the research we've done. It, it won't allow the two of you to have a relationship that feels safe. Even 10 years later, if something is still an issue, there has to be a sense that it's okay to talk about it, and that both people know that it's not a problem if you say, I've been mad at you for 10 years and I haven't shared this with you, your response should not be, why have we waited this long? It's not fair. I don't want to talk about it. Your response should be, this makes me sad that you haven't felt like you've been able to talk about it. I am so thrilled that you're bringing it up. You two have to have that kind of policy in your marriage. And in the first year especially, you want to be checking out to see if there's anything left over. And it's not about problem solving the issue. It's about helping your partner understand. Because what I want you to keep in your mind over the first year and, and for future is there's really three main elements of communication that you need to make sure is present in this marriage. The first one is, are you accessible to each other? If you are, that's wonderful. If you're not, 
you need to find out what gets in the way of that. Number two, are you responsive? Are you someone that your partner would define as being very responsive? If you are someone that they see as accessible and also responsive to their needs, you've been doing great. Number three, engaged. When you are reachable, meaning accessible, when you're responsive, do you engage? Are conversations between the two of you more a monologue than a dialogue? You want to make sure your marriage is filled with dialogues, not monologues. So one of the other elements with this is we have these communication elements. Sometimes we have challenges and we're not quite sure how do we learn how to do these things. Now, of course, there's couples counseling, but I don't necessarily buy into that all of you should go out there if you haven't done some of this and go find a couples counselor. I think one of the best things that you should do is a newly married couple is surround yourself with people who have the kind of marriage that you want. You know, we all know that surrounding yourself with successful people, there becomes a culture of that. Surrounding yourself with people in healthy marriages, you will learn by osmosis and you will develop a relationship that emulates that. That's a wonderful thing because you want what they have. You want people who've been married a long time, have been done the work, and they too have relationships that you can learn by the role modeling that they have, especially if you come from a background that doesn't have that, that your parents were not one that showed you how to deal with conflict or communication or intimacy. So surround yourself and hang out with those kind of people. You can find them all over. Find them at church. You can find them in work. Find them in social groups. But surround yourself with the people that you want to be like. What that also is about is setting yourself up to having realistic expectations of marriage. If your expectation is in this first year, everything's going to be wonderful. Most people will tell you the first year is pretty awful because there's so much learning. Now, I wouldn't say awful, but what they'll tell you is was a difficult transition from pre-marriage to post-marriage, even if they've lived together. What you two want to create for yourself is your own love story. So don't forget something. No two marriages are going to be the same. You shouldn't focus on copying them to being just like them, but learn some of the skills by what you observe from them to bring this into your love story, into your marriage. What I would like the two of you begin to look at each other as, which is Siamese twins. You two are Siamese twins that has one heart. And your job as the twin is to make sure that your partner and their heart is healthy and happy. If it's not, put it into your head that you will die. That's how passionate you need to be about this. You need to be so passionate that your job for the rest of your life is to make sure that big, wonderful heart of your partners is always nurtured, happy, and that you're doing everything you can because it impacts you in such a big way that you will have as many conversations about things as you need to. You will deal with the issues when they come up. You won't run away from it because you can't. It's part of your body here. Remember, it's your heart. And that the two of you always treat that heart with respect, kindness, consideration, and most importantly, love. This episode is sponsored by Stewart's Daily Notes. Stewart's Daily Notes is an email newsletter from the couple's expert that will improve your marriage in five minutes a day. 
Small things can have a big impact on your relationship over time. Sign up for Stuart's Daily Notes. It's a resource of tools, videos, exercises, and more. All done by the couples expert, Stuart Fensterheim, with 30 years of clinical experience working with couples. Delivered straight to your inbox. The best part about it, it's free. Sign up today. Go to www.thecouplesexperts.com and change your relationship every single day of your life together. Now back to the episode. So those are two or three things so far that we're learning. So what, what other tips do I have? One of the tips that I have for this is remembering something. And now let's talk about children. Okay, raising children is not easy. There are so many couples out there that struggle that say, if I had, and, and I would hope by now this doesn't happen, but I'm usually amazed that it continues to do because I know what it's like to raise two girls. And it wasn't easy, but I'm so thrilled and so proud of who they've become. But it was not easy and it had a huge impact and stress on the marriage. Having a child will not help your relationship be closer. It's a challenge. So my advice to all of you, if children is something that you want for your marriage, is you must wait a minimum of a year. If you already have children, I would say two. And I want you to remember a mathematic formula. We all know when we add one plus one, what that equals. People would say that equals two. I would suggest to you when it comes to kids, one plus one equals four. Now what I mean by that is the stress and problems that can create in a marriage is so great. It's almost like having four kids. And most people say, wait a minute, I don't want four kids. I only want two kids. Well, what I'll tell you is that if you have a child while you're early in your marriage, it may feel like eight. So I don't recommend having children unless you've been married at least two years if you already have a child because the two of you got together, it's not your first marriage, and now you're bringing a family together and you want to join the family and you want your own children, wait two years so that you and your partner have that time period to really establish this relationship in a wonderful way. One of the most important tips that I'm going to give you has to be you have to work on the trust that you have for each other. Now, when we talk about trust, I'm not talking about issues of fidelity. I'm talking about emotional trust. That is your words and your actions consistent. Part of that foundation that we talked about earlier is that you have to have a relationship where your partner defines you as that what you say is what's going to happen. And that means with promises about showing up to places, timeliness, taking care of yourself from a health perspective, diet, and in all ways that when you open your mouth and your partner hears your words, they know that they can count on it happening. So if you say, we're going to go on a vacation, nothing gets in the way because this couple's vacation that you've already decided you're going to do, you can't like work interfere. Now, sometimes that'll happen. And then you have to talk about that. But the, the most important message here, that if you're working on trust and we're working on trusting each other, both in terms of how you feel emotionally and also in terms of can I count on the words you say? Is it something that if you say, I promise I will do this, it gets done is an essential ingredient in a marriage. And in the beginning of a marriage, you're being scrutinized in this area. One of the things that most people will say is that the difference between when we've lived together and married and now married is pretty big. 
So what that means is people go into a marriage with that idea of, I got to see what now what life is going to be like. Can I count on my partner now that we're together? What's going to change, if anything? One of the biggest areas with this, clearly, are things like household chores. A partner that was once very hopeful around the house, now with the stress of the marriage, the stress of work, the stress of family, do they show up in the same way? Be careful that you don't set your relationship up for sexual stereotypes. I hear it a lot where people go, you know, one of us is going to deal with the outside of the house, the other deals with the inside. It doesn't work, in my opinion. I think shared responsibilities is the only way that really works. So if you have a stay-at-home mom and a dad that works, or you have one person stays home and the other doesn't, it means you, and if there are children, you both have two jobs. So when you get home, no one gets to sit and drink beer and eat bonbons. What happens is when you get home, the, the questions that get asked is, what can I do to chip in? Trusting and counting on each other that everyone's doing their part and no one is shirking their responsibilities. And you have to talk about everything. This is the other tip I want to give you. There really should be very little that you don't talk about. So often I hear people talking about you know, we, I never hear you talking about work. I feel like I'm left out. What you want this relationship to build on is the friendship that you had. When you first got together, most of us stay up till three o'clock in the morning talking about everything. And then when I see couples in my office and I say, so how's your just ch chatting? They say, we don't talk. I don't know how that happens. How'd you go from staying up till three o'clock in the morning talking about everything and now you're in a marriage and there's very little that you talk about? Keep that communication alive. Do things such as joining groups, going to social events, things that give you something to enlighten and pa have passion about so that neither one of you ever would describe your relationship as it feels like we're roommates, not lovers. Be passionate about everything you do. Talk about everything. If some funny thing happened at work, come home and talk about work. That's not talking about and rehashing all the minuscule things that may have gone on at work, but think about something. You're not together. Your partner wants to know what your life is like without them. And how many of us don't even check in with our partners during the day? With technology, we should be checking in a lot. We should be sending emoticons and we should be sending jokes that we hear and we should be just checking in and saying, thinking about you. Something that takes maybe 30 seconds can keep your relationship strong. And in the first year of marriage especially, you want to make sure it's powerful. Memorize this statement as I go through this. I want to make sure that you guys, because I don't want everyone to hear this is so heavy, because I'm talking pretty passionately about this. I want you to really memorize this statement. The first year of marriage is a learning and transitional period for the rest of your life. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to your spouse. Remind each other that when you're in those rough periods, that it gets easier. And if you really start wondering, did I make a mistake? And so often that comes up at some point. I want you to keep something in mind. And it's a really cool statement that I heard someone said a while back. The grass isn't greener on the other side. What makes grass green, it's greener where you water it. So water your grass in your marriage, particularly in the first year. Pull the weeds out. 
talk about things when they come up. Don't allow things to get in the way to have you second guessing yourself. And one of the rules that I want you to really put a tattoo in your brain is the statement that never gets made to your partner in the first year or in any year is maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should get divorced. I want you to make such a strong commitment to yourself that those words don't ever come out of your mouth. Because no marriage needs to have a divorce as part of it. I believe that at the bottom of my heart. And as some of you who've been around a while and know me, know that I come from and I've been divorced. And I've said more times than not, because of what we know today, that divorce likely would not have happened. The skills that we now have won't make that a necessary evil in our society, if you believe me. If you trust what I'm saying, and I want you to check it out, do the reading, but any relationship with the knowledge we now have will be able to be one that is filled with love and togetherness. And the first year of marriage can be so tough that sometimes these negative thoughts enter them. And you need to control your thinking in a way that doesn't allow you to even go there. And if you automatically have this intrusive thing that goes into your brain, you need to look at it and say, get the heck out of here. I'm not going there. I'm not even thinking about it. I'm not even allowing myself. And part of that in the first year of marriage, just like we have wedding albums, I highly recommend in the first year that you have a marriage book the first year. Create exciting adventures. Put pictures, social media posts, one of the elements with social media, though, I do want to talk about is post how exciting life is. Even if you've had a few days or a few weeks or even a couple of months that haven't gone so well, don't post that your marriage is having a rough time. Don't be talking to friends or family about the struggles. Talk to your partner. That's why that communication is so essential. Make sure that you keep yourself with an uplift, positive attitude that your marriage is a work in progress and that the two of you are so exciting that you're building this life together because kindness is the most essential thing. And that means kind to yourself as well. That even if it feels like a struggle, recognize it's just part of the picture and that the two of you are working together to make this into a wonderful, wonderful life together. Enjoy your newlywed status. What that means is you won't be a newlywed forever, but let yourself just really relish in the feelings that you probably are having right now. And I hope that most of you listening to this is going, well, listening to this, but we don't really need it and that you're enjoying this first year. You're enjoying your marriage. And when you said I do at your wedding day, that thought, that memory, that situation, the day that you got married, and the goals that you've set with your partner just makes you smile. Now, we all know that there are certain types of things that people struggle with, and money being one of those. So I want you and your partner to make sure you have a financial plan starting right now. And that financial plan is about saving for retirement. If you're thinking of having children, beginning to look into 529 plans, making sure that you have a 401k, making sure that you have life insurance, making sure that you've got the uh, beneficiary and all those things converted over. If you haven't done so, do that right away. Sit down and do an estate plan. If you've got a business together, talking about those things and how your marriage impacts 
the business and what happens with your business. You want to have open dialogues about all of these things and talking about your financial goals. If there are children that are in the mix from a previous marriage, how do they fit into your financial goals? What about college? I know that may seem way, way, way away, but those are the conversations that you want to have and those are the things that will tell the two of you, we talk about everything. We do that. The other thing that we know is that people quite often fight about sex. Maybe not so much in the first year of marriage, but in a marriage, sometimes a sexual relationship can be a challenge. But I want to think of intimacy not just as sexual, but also about affection and how much non-sexual touch is there, how much hand-holding and cuddling. If you're not very touchy-feely, and I hear that a lot from people, well, I'm not really touchy-feely. Well, you may have to get touchy-feely. Because if your partner needs you to be touchy-feely, we're talking about a behavior. We're talking about keeping in mind what your partner's needs are. Those are essential things in a marriage that your partner knows you may be not be very touchy-feely, but they touch and feel because they know that you need to be touched and felt. And you do some of what they need. What do they need from a physical relationship? If we're talking about sex, making sure that you two have an active sex life. If your sex life in the beginning of your marriage is not very active, you may want to look at that. Why isn't that happening? Is it a nature of the relationship? Or is it just that we're just both of us not very sexual? I don't find that very often. I find that sex not happening in a relationship is more often than not a product of some disconnection. Now, if there are medical challenges, that's a whole different discussion. But one of the things that I want you to come up with, the two of you, is a number of times sexually that you two need to feel satisfied with your sex life. And if the answer is every single day, come up with a different number because you're not being realistic. Most couples, in some of the research I've done recently, are engaging sexually between two to four times a month. At a minimum, I think once or twice a week is what you should be talking about. And I want it scheduled so that if weeks are going by and it's not happening, you can convert back to your schedule of what the agreements has been and you stick to that schedule. Because what we know is that people who define their relationship as satisfying, 90% will say the only way that they define their relationship as satisfying is if they have an active sex life. And talking about sex is a highly difficult thing for a lot of couples. And you have to talk about it, both in terms of frequency, quality, what kinds of things you enjoy doing, what kinds of things you need from your partner, what about initiation of sex, what about experimentation, how much of that, what do you see as erotic and what's not erotic, what's a turn on and what's a turn off. If your partner says to you, I don't want to do this, your job, regardless of how you feel about it, is to not to pressure them and look at alternatives. What else can we do that would be equally satisfying to you? Because your partner has to feel like they can be who they are and that who you love is who they are, not what you want them to be. And in sex, as in all areas, that becomes a real challenge sometimes. You need to be able to resolve your conflicts as moments of disconnection that are opportunities for growth. And I want you to, to really come at all these times that may be periods of disconnection or a conflict and see them as an opportunity to learn more and more about your partner 
What do they need to feel loved and see those as opportunities for you to really send the message clearly to your partner how much you love them? So that your partner who shares with you a problem, you may see as a complaint, but what I choose to see those as is I'm going to now learn something about my partner that is a gold mine. Because if I take what they're saying literally and seriously and respond to it, they're going to see me as the best thing that ever happened to them. And that's what we want for this first year. You want for your first year of marriage to be a marriage in which both of you are able to say, I am so proud of what we're creating. I am so proud that out of this big wide world, I found this person, the luck of the draw of all the millions of people out here, that we found each other. And by finding each other, we know that we have chosen our partner that person in our life that is making our whole world a most exciting experience, a wild ride, a time of love and togetherness and building a life with both family, friends, and each other, and making sure that when we go to bed at night and we start dozing off to sleep, what happens is we just smile because we turn over, see our partner there, and are able to say, life is good. Take care, have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you again next time. Bye-bye now from the couples expert, Stuart Fensterheim. Stay connected. Thank you for listening. This episode has ended, but your journey continues. Head over to www thecouplesexperts.com to access all the links and resources mentioned in this episode as well as bonus content exclusive to podcast listeners enjoyed this episode why not hit subscribe now and never miss an episode 